This is the word we use for what Americans might call a bellboy or a bellhop. Hello, I'm Lawrence and I'm on a quest to uncover all of the memos that Britain and America lost in the pond and one of those memos pertains to hotels, or as they're known in Britain, hotels. I mean, it's the same. And of course, as a certified YouTube sensation, I've done my fair bit of world travel, right? Just off the top of my head, I've been to Britain, America, you know, and I think from that I've stayed in quite a few hotels, so I know what I'm talking about. But when it comes to the two countries, whether you're just looking for a quick getaway or something discreet, it is worth learning that hotels in Britain aren't necessarily the same as their American counterparts. And so without further ado, let's metaphorically ding one of those bells at reception as I uncover ways that British and American hotels are very different. <laughs> You know, when I was out there for the first time on the American open road, living the hotel lifestyle on my honeymoon, the first confusing thing that I noticed is that elevators in American hotels, and as it turns out, everywhere else, insist upon taking you to different floors to what they would in Britain. Lawrence, what do you mean by that? Well, here's how elevators slash lifts, we'll get onto terminology later, work in Britain. The floor where I enter the hotel and speak to reception and ask them if they have any free dental floss is known in Britain as the ground floor. When you enter the elevator you press G to stay on the ground floor, nobody would ever do that, or number one to go up to the floor above, or number two above that, three above that and you get my drift. But in America, I don't know why my hand is still up there, in America it's a little bit different because that same floor where I enter the hotel and talk to reception and ask them for some free dental floss and they actually know what dental floss is, is the first floor and this is usually denoted in the elevator by the number one. So the floor immediately above that is two, and then three, and then four, and then five, and then I'm a little bit hazy after that. And then you get to your room, and this is where those pan-Atlantic differences really take shape. Or, should I say, size, because there's one key rule. On the whole, British hotel rooms tend to be smaller than their American counterparts. And the reason for this, as we all know, is that America marginally outfreedoms Britain. But it's also because Britain is about a 40th the size of the United States. And so we just sort of cram things in. In fact, awkwardly, a tiny British hotel room was where I first met my in-laws. And they were staying in a room about the size of this studio. Which, surprisingly, given that I am often dubbed America's finest British import, is not that big. And at the best of time, I don't like being in close proximity to humans. So being squashed in a room with my future in-laws was the second most horrifying experience of my life. And I know what you're thinking, ooh, Lawrence, what was the first? Being squashed in the elevator with them on the way up. But the next time we met in an American hotel, we sure did have a chuckle. At least I think we did. I couldn't hear them because they were on the other side of the room. You see, American hotel rooms like cars or portion sizes or America itself are just bigger. I mean, they'd have to be, right? Especially given what we've discovered on this channel about the differences in bed sizes. And of course, a bed is not the only place in a hotel room where you lie down. In addition to the bed, the sofa, and in desperate times, the closet, which should prompt nobody to ask me about the coat hanger incident of 1998, there is also the bathtub. And I know what you're thinking, yes, Lawrence, the British bathtub has separate taps for hot and cold. Well, firstly, that's not always true. And secondly, that's not where I was going with this. I was actually gonna mention the floor height, because while in America, the bathroom floor and the bottom of the bathtub are more or less level with each other, this is often not the case in Britain. To go from the floor to the bathtub, you often have to kind of step up because the bottom of the bathtub is higher up than the floor. There's one thing to remember this getting in, but getting out when your feet are wet and soapy, it could lead to an unintentionally hilarious TikTok video. In fact, I do have footage, but I can't show it on here because I'd get hundreds of complaints and an equal number of marriage proposals. So just take my word for it. <laughs> Electric plugs are of course found in many places and through much of our daily lives, but never more do I need them than when I'm in a hotel. So because of this, it is worth remembering some of the key differences between British and American plug sockets. But don't take my word for it, instead listen to me from last year. It was once said by me in just a second from now that you can tell a lot about a country by the size of its plugs, and given its unparalleled record of boasting larger stuff than everyone else, America might fancy its chances of winning the my plugs bigger than your plug debate, but the truth is, and you might find this shocking, 
British plugs are larger. You can't talk about AC plugs without talking about prongs. Prongs are the protruding sticks of metal that keep the plug adjoint to the wall like a docked plane. And the only reason I made an aviation simile there was to draw your attention to the miniature control tower I made from British and American adapters while I was bored. Anyway, there are several key differences in this department. On British plugs, the prongs are ever so slightly longer and crucially thicker. This makes them sturdier and impossible to bend. How do I know that? Because I was 14 once. But whereas British plugs, that is type G plugs, are decidedly triple pronged, that's not always the case in America. Sure, type B plugs, the ones whose sockets look like surprised ghosts, definitely do have three prongs. But type A plugs, which are easily the more outgoing and competitive of the two, are bi-pronged. Due to the manner in which each country feeds the wires into the plug, there's also a difference in how they hang from the wall socket. In Britain, the wire hangs vertically from the plug, thus making it harder to yank from the wall by pulling the cable. And the horizontal connection of American plugs means that you can do this in theory, but it's not recommended. One of the biggest concerns for Americans visiting Britain, aside from being forced to eat mushy peas, is the Great British-American voltage divide. In Britain, residential voltage is categorised as 230 volts, while it's generally 120 in the US. Moreover, British mains electricity operates on a 50 hertz frequency and America on 60. What does all of this mean? Well, let's just say that you want to use your American laptop in Britain, but it doesn't run on 230 volts, is not dual voltage, or is incompatible with 50 hertz. In that instance, you'll need to run to Toshi Station to pick up some power converters. A power converter will convert the voltage from 230 to the voltage of your laptop. In the event that your power converter doesn't come with a Type G plug, adapter, be sure to also pick up one of these. This plug adapter is magic. It allows you to turn your Type A or B American plug into a Type G British plug. For Brits visiting America, the same applies, but in reverse. A step-down power converter or transformer might also be needed to safely use devices in the US. Both are widely available for Americans and Brits on Amazon. I'd say the most obvious difference between British and American hotels is the temperature. When I first stayed in an American hotel, I couldn't believe how cool it was. And not in a Morgan Freeman type way. I mean, this was a double tree. I just mean it was air conditioned. But in Britain, you don't usually have that problem and or luxury because a significant amount of British hotel rooms are either not air conditioned or not air conditioned well. This is a particular problem when you're squished in one with your future in-laws. As with many areas of life, hotels are their own subgenre of British versus American word differences. Take, for instance, the name that we assign to that helpful hotel staff member who helps you with your luggage when you're checking in or out. In Britain and much of the rest of the world, this person is known as a hotel porter. This is the word we use for what Americans might call a bellboy or a bellhop. Also, whether it's situated on the ground or the first floor, Brits and Americans also can't agree what you call that area of the hotel that you enter upon entering. In Britain, we usually opt for the word foyer. Please note that Americans, just like patrons on my most recent secret stream, are divided on whether this should be pronounced foyer or foyer. Either way, Americans will often call this area the lobby. More often than not, Brits will call an elevator a lift. And Americans will call a lift an elevator, while Americans have about a hundred words for a sofa bed. Chief among these are hide a bed, bed couch, sleeper sofa, or pull out sofa. And finally, valet parking. This is something I've encountered far more in the United States than I have in Britain. This is a parking service offered at hotels in which you pay a valet to park your car for you. But the use of valet might be confusing to some Brits who might think of a valet, often pronounced valet, as a male servant, a fine example of which is the character of Jeeves from P.G. Woodhouse's Jeeves and Worcester novels that I somehow keep mentioning in my videos just by coincidence. That's it for this video. Let me know in the comments below some of the hotel differences that you've encountered. I'm Lawrence Brown. You can follow me on Twitter at Lost in the Pond US and don't forget to subscribe to my channel so that my videos don't get lost in the pond. And thank you to my patrons for literally making this video happen. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so today at patreon.com slash lost in the pond. Until the next video, goodbye.